Hi, this is TK Coleman, and you're tuning in to the 2015 Annual Retreat for the Foundation for Economic Education. Today I'll be speaking with Larry Reed about the relationship between character and a free society. Larry, in your book, Are We Good Enough for Liberty, as well as in many of your talks, you make the case that there's this inseparable relationship between character and a free society. So I'd like to begin by asking you, what do you mean by the word character? What do you mean by the term free society? Mm -hmm. And what exactly is the relationship between those two? Okay. Uh, it's true that we use that term character in a lot of different ways. Sometimes we mean it to say uh, <clears throat> that someone is uh, special in some odd way. We say he's a character. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he has character. I mean character uh, in terms of that cluster of, of personal traits that almost everybody, the great majority of people, would agree uh, that if all of us practiced them more, we'd have a freer, better, more prosperous, happier place to live. Uh, there's a general consensus of the kinds of traits that I'll touch on in just a moment, that they are good things that make for a better society. Things like uh, honesty, uh, keeping your word, uh, being a man or woman of, uh, of honor. When you make a contract, you keep it. I can't imagine a free society in the absence of an honest people. I think it's that cri uh, critical. If, if uh, large numbers of people felt nothing about uh, uh, breaking their word or, or lying and prevaricating at, at, at the drop of a hat, uh, I think you'd descend into chaos, and out of the chaos, somebody would, uh, some strong man would knock heads together and, and bring order at the expense of our liberty. Uh, but there are other traits that are important that I think define character the way I mean it. Uh, things like intellectual humility, the idea that uh, as much as you may know, you should recognize uh, that there is a universe of knowledge out there that you don't know. That was one of the lessons of uh, uh, Leonard Reed's classic essay, I Pencil. Uh, the, the notion that uh, no, no one person in the world knows how to make a pencil from start to scratch entirely on his own. And if you don't know how to make a pencil, then what does that say about your ability or anybody's ability to plan an economy of 320 million people? Uh, other traits of character that I think are important, indispensable to a free society, uh, would be uh, responsibility. Uh, not blaming others for the consequences of your poor judgments, owning up to them being responsible for them. I think responsibility is, I can't imagine a society, uh, a free society without people uh, holding that up to um, a lofty uh, aspiration. Uh, Self-reliance to, to the extent you have the ability to be so, I think is important because the more self-reliant you are, the more likely you're gonna be able then to help others who are less so. Uh, there are other important traits too, courage. Courage. Can you imagine a free society surviving or even coming, coming into being in the absence of courage? I mean, the world is full of people, always has been, who would be happy to take your liberty at the drop of a hat. Hmm. Uh, so people who believe in liberty, I think, have to stand up for it, have to defend it, speak on its behalf, sometimes put their lives on the line, uh, because it can be lost easily through uh, a timidity and backing off and allowing uh, usurpers to take your liberty from you. So I think those are important traits and I think uh, they're indispensable to a free society by which I mean an environment where people are responsible, uh, adults who make choices for their lives, go as far as their talents can take them, uh, and uh, are free to do so without the intrusiveness of uh, an offensive, aggressive uh, government or force from any source. Would you say that markets are neutral on character, or do they enhance it, detract from it? I think that markets enhance character. Uh, think about this. In the days before uh, capitalism, uh, the Middle Ages and before, uh, you could get away with wrapping a robe around yourself and put a crown on your head and, and uh, declaring, uh, I'm the queen, I'm the king, cough it up. But uh, under capitalism, you can't do that. People will laugh at you. Uh, you've got to actually serve others if you're ever to be successful at improving yourself. You have to find a product, a service, something you can provide that other people want. Uh, so instead of looking for ways to take from others, in a free society, you have to, if you want to do better, you have to 
collaborate with others. You have to work with them. You have to employ them. You have to encourage their patronage uh, as customers for your products. So I think markets encourage uh, a strong character. And so in many respects, liberty and character, or free society and character, are two sides uh, of the same coin. Capitalism, you say that word as if it's a good thing. For a lot of people, that's a dirty word. Yeah. It's, it, it's become somewhat of a, a catch-all term to refer to everything that's wrong with society. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Uh, capitalism gets a bad rap because there are some bad capitalists who in fact use the force of government, use their political connections to, to get ahead. When I see that, I, uh, you know, some people call that crony capitalism. I call it crony socialism because that's what socialism is all about. Socialism is a world of uh, political connections, determining how far you go, the use of political power. Uh, I don't think there's anything about capitalism, as I understand it, that is inherently uh, uh, you know, cr cronyist, or in the sense of using government, uh, using the force of, of government to get ahead. Um, there are better words to use. Free enterprise if, uh, is a good one. But uh, I don't define capitalism as a system that includes uh, the use of deception, fraud, force, violence, uh, political power from government to get ahead. That's not capitalism uh, in my book. So what would be your response to the person who says, all right, you say you support character and capitalism, but what do we make of all of these questionable activities performed by the rich and the greedy? Yeah. Uh, you hear a lot of that uh, these days, and you're going to hear more of it if uh, government continues to grow and pass out favors. The, the reason that so many people in the business world and elsewhere are involved in government is that government is so involved in them and their lives and their businesses. Uh, so a lot of people use government uh, not only to get something, but they're also involved with it to keep it at bay. The answer to it is to uh, confine government to its proper duties of the defense of life and property of all people, not the dispenser of privileges and favors and subsidies and handouts. Uh, that breeds corruption. Uh, so, uh, and also, you have to remember that at any given time, any profession in society, including business, government, whatever, is going to be reflective of the general culture of character. If character has been widely eroded in society, uh, the bad effects of it are going to show up in all walks of life. You're going to see it in, in politicians, you're going to see it in business people, media people, all walks of life. Until character is rebuilt, you're never going to get rid of, of uh, all of uh, those bad consequences. But you can go a long way if you confine the use of political power to the defense of us all, not to the uh, dispensing of special privileges to a few. Mm -hmm. There's a famous Milton Friedman quote, and I'm going to have to paraphrase here, but he says something along the following lines, that if you want to fix political problems, don't focus on voting for the right people, yeah. but focus on making it politically profitable for the wrong people to do the right things. Does that oppose what you're saying, or are, are those ideas reconcilable? Oh, I think it's perfectly uh, in accord with uh, those ideas. Uh, I see politics, and I think Friedman did too, as reflective of the general climate of opinion. If you want to change politics, whether for the better or for the worse, you first change the climate of opinion. Politicians rarely conceive of ideas. They usually reflect them. And they reflect uh, the ideas that uh, they think they can advance and still win re-election with. Yeah. So until you change the climate of opinion, uh, don't expect big changes at the, at the political level. There are a lot of folks who think politics is everything, and that's where they put their time, their attention, their money, and so forth. But, you know, in a lot of ways, that's like locking the barn door after the horse is left. Uh, and you'll be eternally disappointed because politicians are buffeted by lots of conflicting forces. If you really want to change things, work on young people, or at least work on ideas, and if you succeed there, uh, then the good from that will be reflected in politics and everything else. You've traveled over 80 different countries in six different continents. Are there any experiences or individuals that stand out to you as particularly good examples of uh, demonstrating strong character? Oh, yeah. Do we have a couple hours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can give you uh, quite a few. Uh, one that uh, I so enjoy talking about, and this man is still living, 
I'll have a chance again to visit him in uh, uh, May uh, 2015 when he turns 106. And I've known him personally for about uh, 15 years. His name is uh, Sir Nicholas Winton. Uh, he saved almost 700 Jewish children from the Nazis in 1938-39, uh, right before World War II began. And he did that uh, sometimes at risk to himself. Uh, and he did it uh, without a desire to achieve fame or fortune from it. He couldn't talk about it for 50 years after he did it. Uh, and uh, what a courageous thing to have done. And he was able to do that in spite of the opposition of most governments of the world who would not even allow these endangered children to leave harm's way and, and get to safety. Uh, he fought that tooth and nail. It's an example of private initiative of a man who faced government opposition to save lives, did his best, and ended up saving 669. Uh, he's since been knighted by the Queen. He is uh, Sir Nicholas Winton. He's been the subject of a 60 Minutes segment uh, earlier this past year. Uh, and uh, when I saw him last uh, in May of 2014, uh, at 105, he was still sharp as a tack and uh, eager to, uh, to talk. And so I'm looking forward to seeing him again uh, in May. Uh, other examples I could cite would be from the resistance movements behind uh, the Iron Curtain. Uh, I, since uh, a very early age, I've been very interested in people who uh, go to great length, at great risk th to themselves, in difficult environments to spread ideas of liberty. And people behind the Iron Curtain uh, by the millions did that, and some of them did not survive because of their opposition. But in 1986, uh, I spent a couple of weeks uh, living uh, with uh, people who were active in the underground in Poland. And every night I stayed at a different home uh, to stay one step ahead of the regime, meeting people who were active in endless ways to resist the communist tyranny of uh, uh, Poland in, in those years. Uh, one night I spent uh, oh, the whole evening with a group of underground printers. Uh, these were mostly young people who had been illegally translating the works of great uh, Western scholars on liberty, translating them into Polish, printing them illegally, and distributing them underground throughout uh, Poland. And they brought out stacks of this stuff, and I, I was just amazed. And I, I asked them at one point, well, where do you guys get the paper to print all this? Because the government owns all the you know, factories that produce uh, paper. And one young man named Pavel, uh, sort of with a smile, said, we get it from two places. One, we smuggle it in from the West, and two, we steal it from communists. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, in the factories and the printing plants that the government owns, increasingly the workers there are, are on our side. And when the coast is clear, they smuggle the paper out to us, and even on some occasions, they've used the government's printing presses to print our stuff. And uh, I'll always think of that, the bravery of those young people when uh, I think of Poland. And I should tell this story that comes from Poland as well. Um, just one year ago, uh, the man that uh, I'm about to tell you about uh, passed away, a great Polish hero. His name was Zbigniew Romaszewski. He and his wife, Sofia, had run the underground radio uh, for solidarity in the first six months of martial law, which was declared in December of 81. That's when the Polish regime, uh, under threat of invasion from Moscow, <clears throat> um, decided to clamp down. They banned Solidarity and other uh, groups organized for things like peace and, and freedom. Uh, they uh, put thousands of people behind bars, and a dark night descended upon Poland until the big changes of the uh, evaporation of the evil empire in 1989. So I was there in 86, in the middle of that, and uh, one of those evenings, I was told, uh, was going to be very special because I was to meet Zbigniew and Sofia Romaszewski. Never heard of them before. And here, they had run underground radio uh, for solidarity uh, during that martial law period early on until they were arrested. He was given four years in prison. She was given three. Neither had been out of prison very long when I met with them in their home. Uh, in November of 86, 
And here they were active again on behalf of freedom for Poland, not doing radio, but doing other things. And uh, I asked them a lot of questions about what was it like to run an underground radio against this uh, powerful regime at great risk to themselves. I, I posed questions like, well, you know, ultimately you're up against the Army, Navy, and the Air Force of the Soviet Union. They're not going to let this happen, uh, and let freedom come to Poland without giving it a hard time. How do you answer that? Well, they were incredibly optimistic. It didn't matter to them what the chances for success were. It didn't matter. They knew freedom to be right, and so they were going to work for it no matter what. And at one point I said, uh, well, how did you know when you were broadcasting uh, if people were listening? And uh, Sophia answered it this way. She said, well, we wondered that too. We can only broadcast uh, eight or ten minutes at a time. And then we had to go off the air to avoid uh, detection, go someplace else, set the radio up again. Mm -hmm. But she said, one night while we were broadcasting, we said over the air, if you believe in freedom for Poland, the message of this radio, will you please blink your lights and call your friends who believe the same way, ask them to do the same. And she then said, we went to the window, and for hours, all of Warsaw was blinking. Well, uh, <laughs> two and a half years later, Poland became a free country. It was a, uh, the free elections of June of 89 swept the communists out of power. Uh, Zbigniew Romaszewski was elected to the lower house of parliament. A few years later, uh, to the upper house, to the Senate. And that's where he was uh, until just a year ago, in early 2014, when he passed away. So it's heroic stories like that that make me think, Golly, you know, we shouldn't complain about the obstacles that we face. Can you imagine? Can you imagine going back to Valley Forge, the winter of 1776, 77, 78? And uh, can you imagine uh, going up to Washington and his troops and saying something like, uh, boy, we got it rough. We just got a bad health care law. You know what the response would be. They would say, what are you talking about? Get off your duff and go to work. Uh, change things, get involved, look what we're doing. So when I think back to the men and women who sacrificed so much for our liberty, uh, I think we should never let any obstacle set us back, deter us, change our minds. Uh, once you know what's right, uh, take the example of these great heroes and work your heart out for it. And I think in the end you'll never regret it. When you say we shouldn't complain in light of the suffering these people go through. That touches on a very important point, that there seems to be this connection between being a person of character and having suffered. When I talk with people who seem to me to be people of good character, they, they always have some sort of story about how freedom just didn't come easily for them. Mm -hmm. Is suffering necessary for the development of character, or can character be taught or imparted to someone who may not have had a difficult life? I think it can be taught more by the power of example than by lecturing. I think people are affected more by real life stories of real people who have been exemplars of character than they are by lectures on it. Uh, but I also think that when it comes to suffering, uh, it, it can, if the person who's suffering uh, is of the right character, it can be a character builder. It can be something that uh, there have been many cases of people who have grown and improved and gotten better only because they endured the crucible of suffering. Uh, I would never advocate it for anybody, but I, I applaud when someone uh, comes out of suffering and puts two and two together, learns from it, and turns it to good advantage. I think that's, that's a powerful combination. Uh, certainly, if you've suffered the absence of freedom, you may know better firsthand the importance of it than those who've always taken it for granted. There are endless examples of that. So yeah, suffering can, uh, in the long run, both build character and uh, make you a stronger person, more effective spokesperson for the things you suffered for. And I guess it's important to say, too, that suffering can also break a person yeah. and make someone of seemingly good character lose their way. And, and that seems to point to the fact that there's definitely that element of choice in all this. That's right. Uh, oh, one of the great uh, uh, survivors of the Holocaust, uh, Viktor Frankl, wrote a book called, uh, oh, what's the title? Uh, the 
Man's Search for Meaning. Man's Search for Meaning, yes, and uh, on this very subject and how he turned even the most incredibly awful, unspeakable conditions that he endured into an opportunity for introspection and improvement and growth. He turned it into a learning experience and he was and ultimately a better man perhaps because of what he endured. That takes character and uh, I admire that. That's why at FEE we love to tell stories, especially to young people, of people like Viktor Frankl and others who have endured and suffered on behalf of, of uh, sound principles. They are so admirable and people we should emulate, no question. So what are some of the things FEE's doing today to sort of promote this message? And are there any success stories you can share with us about that? The message of character and liberty and the, the fact that they're two sides of the same coin in many respects is, is infused into everything we do now at FEE. You see it on the website. You see it in uh, the articles that we post. You see it in themes at seminars, the, the, the things that speakers talk about at our programs. Uh, it, it isn't uh, the only thing we talk about, but it's core to it, because we want young people to understand that, that liberty is, in fact, a lofty calling. It really is. It's, it's something that should summon forth a desire to set new standards, high standards of your personal character. Uh, they go hand in hand. Uh, and if you can inspire young people to think of liberty as the other side of the character coin, as a very high, lofty, admirable calling, I think you've got the likelihood of, of keeping them on our side and keeping them uh, a lifelong uh, advocate for liberty. If you just sell liberty on the basis of you should be for it because it produces the most stuff, free economies do better than unfree. And that's demonstrably to, true. It should not even be uh, subject to dispute. But if that's all you do, if you use that one argument to convince people that you should be for liberty and free markets because it, they produce the most stuff, well, then your converts are going to be vulnerable to the first guy who comes along and says, but it isn't fair. And if you just put me or people with my friends in power to redistribute income and push people around a little bit, we can make things better off. And off we go down the path to the destruction of our liberties uh, in our society. So I, I think just infusing that message uh, across all that we do has been profoundly effective. It resonates with kids. It's one of the talks that gets uh, students up on their feet uh, and applauding because it's not enough just to tell them that they're going to inherit an $18 trillion national debt as a result of bad economics. Mm -hmm. They're going to inherit uh, that because of lousy character and that uh, this is something they should not want to afflict upon their children and the time to work to prevent that is now and that building character is something that ultimately you'll never regret. And, and this message is very apropos because one of the main criticisms of this capitalistic perspective is, well, your message is entirely about getting the state out of the way. It's all about non-intervention, right? And when it comes to the tough questions about, well, what do we do about that suffering person over there? Or what do we do about that poor person over there? The only thing we have to say in response to that is, well, we just don't want the government to do anything about it. And it sounds like there's a, a lack of compassion. But what you're saying is that if we are people of character and if we emphasize that aspect of liberty, we'll actually want to come up with ways to resolve these sorts of things. And we won't just say the state can't do it correctly, yeah. but we'll say we can do it better on our own. Oh, you're so right, uh, TK. You can't have a message that is chronically and incessantly negative. It can't be, oh, everything's going bad or the government is always uh, the problem. Uh, you can turn the tables in the thinking of many people if you start talking positively about what free people can accomplish. I mean, it's incredibly exciting. What free people can do, empower, empowered with good character and the freedom to exercise it. They solve problems better, faster, in a more lasting way than any government bureaucracy can. So at FEE, we like to talk not just about the bad things that government may be doing, but we like to talk about the good things that good people are doing. And so as to encourage more of that, uh, so as to make people sit up and notice and realize, wow, they don't have to focus on a distant politician to fix their problems. They're, they're good folks in their very midst that are doing miraculous things. They need to, to learn more about those things. Larry, I could ask you questions all day, but I want to share you with the audience a bit. I know we have some questions coming in from the internet, and I know people out here are probably chomping at the bit to ask you questions of their own. So let's take some time to open up for Q&A. 
I'm going to pull out my phone, not because I'm interested in checking ESPN.com, <laughs> but because I am going to have the uh, questions here. So I'll start off with one question that comes online, and then we can sort of get ready for the audience. One question is, how do you recommend I talk with my friends about character without preaching to them? Uh, yeah, good question. Uh, and the person's on to something, uh, because uh, if you come across as preachy, I think you're going to defeat your purpose, especially if you're talking to young people. I find that the best way is to talk about real people who have been examples, such, such as some of those we've talked about today. Uh, use real stories to underscore uh, the character traits you want to focus on. I mean, if you want to, if you want to stress courage and, uh, and compassion, well, Telling the Nicholas Winton story does it without having to say to somebody, you need to be more compassionate, you need to be more caring. You, you tell a story of, of a remarkable living individual uh, who achieved a wonderful thing through private, personal initiative. Yeah. That's a very effective uh, way, I think, to reach people. You can't do it if you're preachy and lectury at them. That reminds me of an uh, Indian proverb that says, once you've cut off a person's nose, there's no use in giving them a rose to smell. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. I'm going to use that. That's a Facebook post. <laughs> All right, questions from the audience. We have one here. Yes, uh, you've, used a, a, you've used a few times uh, the term responsible person in a free society. It, for a free society, d does everyone have to be responsible? Does everyone have to be responsible for there to be a free society? Yes. Uh, oh, I, no, I would be the first to argue that uh, you're always going to have some bad apples. You're always going to have irresponsible people. But the weight of humanity, humanity must be on the side of responsibility. Uh, the more irresponsible people you have, the more you, that shows up in the form of uh, bailouts and expectations that the rest of the world owes you a living and that there's nothing wrong with taking it or hiring a politician to take it for you. I don't think a society can remain free if if large numbers of people go down that path. I don't know what the critical numbers are, but I know that uh, the more people uh, are responsible, the more likely you can retain your freedoms. No question. So when you say, are we good enough for liberty, mm -hmm. you're not saying, hey, are we good enough to deserve freedom? but are, are, are we good enough to sustain it if it were given to us? Oh yeah, if you've not uh, afflicted any harm on anyone else, of course you're deserving of liberty by your very nature. Uh, but what I'm saying is every day we should be thinking of liberty as a very lofty calling and asking ourselves, am I good enough? Am I, am I the most honest person I can be? Am I responsible? Am I patient? Am I intellectually humble? If I'm not, I'm probably not gonna be as effective a spokesperson for liberty. Mm -hmm. I can do so much more for society if I am all those things. And uh, liberty thrives to the extent that more people hold very high those, those standards of personal character. Excellent. I've heard the blinking light story in Poland before and it always stuck with me. It's something I heard years ago and it's very captivating. I'm curious if you still stay in touch with any of those people from behind the Iron Curtain when you were, when you were there and what they're doing now, what, what happened, if you had update. Yes, I do stay in touch with a number. In fact, one of the most exciting things, but also time consuming, is answering uh, letters and email <laughs> from people in countries all over the world, but I enjoy every minute of it. Um, I went back to Poland to see uh, Zbigniew and Sofia Romaszewski in the year 2003. Um, that was 17 years after I first met them. And uh, it was a remarkable thing. I, I, I knew he was a Polish senator. And so I thought, well, I, I can go through his Senate website and send him a note. And so I did. I sent him a note saying, hey, you might remember me. I sent you things I published afterwards. I cited the blinking light story that your wife told me. Uh, I'm coming uh, to Poland. Can I see you in Warsaw in August? And uh, he wrote back and he said, yes, I remember you, but we won't be in uh, uh, Warsaw in August. We'll be at our summer home in Zakopane in the Tatra Mountains. Visit us there. And so I did, and I took some friends, and uh, one of the most memorable moments of that trip was being able to say, with the three friends who had heard me tell that story a million times, so good I always wondered if people would think I was making it up. Uh, I said, 
Sophia, would you tell my friends here what you told me when I asked you if, how you knew people were listening? And she told it verbatim, as you heard it today and as I've always told it. Um, yeah, there, I have a lot of friends in uh, those countries from Cambodia to Mozambique, uh, to you name it, uh, that I met in underground work uh, who are uh, uh, still active in various ways. A good friend of mine was the president of the uh, uh, rebel movement in Mozambique for uh, a decade and now is uh, a leading member of the Mozambique parliament. A good friend of mine who is uh, currently the president of Mongolia served as uh, uh, Prime Minister twice, and uh, he was a student activist in his early days against the old communist regime. And uh, I have, he's visited me, and I have been over to Mongolia to visit him. And uh, he's still very active. He's very proud of the fact that he privatized the entire herd of, uh, let me remember the figure, uh, well, it was millions anyway, of yaks in his first time as Prime Minister. He, he, I remember him telling me, I decided right off the bat that, and he speaks very good English, that uh, yaks were not a core function of government. <laughs> and so he sold them all to the herdsmen, and in no time at all, the yak population went through the roof because private owners said, hey, I'm going to take care of my yak and uh, make more yaks. So yeah, it's, a, it's a, a lot of fun staying in touch with such people. Question here. Uh, regarding building character, is suffering noble, or is it just a necessary consequence of living on Earth? Is suffering noble or a necessary consequence of living on Earth? Well, I, th I think it's sooner or later it's inevitable for a lot of people just by nature of you know, uh, what happens in this world. Uh, I wouldn't say it's inherently noble. What is inherently noble is turning it to good advantage, learning from it. Uh, trying to do all that you can, when you can, to help uh, prevent other people from having to endure it. It's how you handle it, I think, that's, that, that is ennobling. One there's, more question. Oh. There's a question coming from the internet that's asking you, Larry, if you could generalize the character traits of people who choose to enter politics. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of something Mark Twain said, one of my favorite quotes. And I don't mean to disparage all politicians because there are some good ones, but he didn't like very many of them. And uh, he one time said of, of one that had passed away that he particularly didn't like, he said, uh, I didn't attend the funeral, but I sent a nice letter indicating that I approved of it. <laughs> um, if you go into politics because you really want to change the world for the better and you don't want to use the force of government to push people around, if you really want to get it off people's backs, out of their pockets and out of their way, if you believe in liberty and you realize that to roll back the state, somebody has to get in on the inside and undo it, uh, then I say more power to you. But recognize that uh, politics is inherently a meat grinder of principles it more often than not takes a good person and makes him bad. Uh, all the more reason to keep it small in the first place. And I think that's one of many reasons why our founders wanted to keep it small because, in fact, there are endless writings of our founders about how corrupting political power can be. And it was one of the reasons they wanted to keep uh, government small and confined to certain narrow functions intended to benefit us all, not uh, a few at the expense of the many. Uh, but if you're of the other kind, and that we're breeding them by the thousands, it seems, who wants to go into politics because they, they love power, uh, I think you're playing with fire. It's nasty, dirty business. Another reason to work for smaller government is, is related to this, and that is that the bigger it gets, the more corrupting, the more nasty it's going to be. The more that government is involved in swiping huge chunks of other people's money and then divvying it up, spending it to, uh, to suit their fancy, the more corrupt and nasty it's going to be internally. So what does that mean? Are good people going to run for office in that kind of environment? Have you noticed how rotten and nasty and mean political campaigns have become in recent years? How many times have you heard people say, why would a good person want to subject himself to that? And I understand that. Many good people don't even think of it. 
So what are we left with? The bad people. And they only make the situation worse. So it is important that some people get involved, but boy, uh, politically, uh, but recognize what a meat grinder it can be. And uh, uh, the rest of us, I guess, have to find the most principled people we can find to go into government and, and, and do that work. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I just don't, uh, I don't see government as an ennobling enterprise. Uh, it never is more compassionate, friendly, nicer, uh, or uh, cleaner than the folks back home, and more often than not, it's less so. But politicians are so good at speaking to us as if they care. Oh, yeah. So how much of bad political policy would you say is the result of sincere ignorance? How much of it is the result of willful malevolence? Well, I wish I knew. I wonder that all the time. I, I see certain politicians and the way they behave, and I can't help but think that there is malevolence there. They really are drunk with power. They really don't care what an outcome may, may be of a policy. They want simply to have the government in charge. They want to be in charge themselves and don't care what the outcome is. There are those people. Uh, but there are plenty of others, I think, who are well-meaning, may even yet be persuadable uh, of a different, different view, but they just don't understand. They don't understand the nature of government. They don't understand, uh, they don't have confidence in their fellow citizens to solve problems without being push, pushed around by politics. Uh, so it's a combination, and, and how much uh, of each there is, I, I just don't know. Hmm. That's really a question about what's in the heart of a person, and it's hard to, hard to say. True. Larry, do you have a favorite president? Yeah, I know, I've often talked about him. Uh, Grover Cleveland was my, my favorite president because I think he exemplified all of these virtues that we've talked about. He was an uh, honest man, it's not to say he was perfect, but uh, he, he really strove to be an honest person. Uh, he uh, uh, vetoed more bills than all the previous 21 presidents combined, uh, and usually because he saw them for what they were, these were measures to grab money from other people through the political process. He, he's an example of a, a man who became president and came to almost all the right conclusions on all the big issues of the day, not because he was an economist or uh, uh, he never went to college, but because he saw things through the prism of character. He was the son of a Presbyterian minister, so he was raised with strong values uh, in the home. And uh, he was for free trade, not because he read Adam Smith. I don't know that there's any evidence that he did, but he was for free trade because he thought of tariffs and quotas and intervention by government in trade as a cynical move by certain people to use political power to disadvantage their competition. And he just thought, good people don't do that. That's dirty business. You don't go after your competitors that way. You compete with them in the marketplace like everybody else. He was for sound money for the same reason. Because he, he thought, uh, you know, inflation of the money supply to stimulate or cover your debts or whatever, he saw that as uh, cheating people. It was dishonest. You don't inflate the money, erode its value, and wipe out people's savings and declare yourself some kind of savior. He saw that as a, a moral issue. And just on down the list, time and again, he came to the right conclusion and for the right ultimate reasons, not just economics, but uh, uh, core principles of morality. And so, um, yeah, I, in fact, his last words, and uh, these are uh, mentioned in the Pulitzer Prize winning biography of him, by Alan Nevins, his last words on his deathbed in 1908 was, or were, <laughs> um, I have tried so hard to do what I thought was right. And maybe he gave a lot of thought to that, but wouldn't that be a great thing for any of us to be able to say when we're about to check out that we tried as hard as we could to have done what was right? I don't think uh, there's any regretting uh, for ever having uh, done that and lived up to that, to be able to say that. So yeah, he's my favorite. We have another question from online, and this one uh, comes from Lee Welter. He says, Thomas Jefferson warned, a poorly educated society will not remain free. Is this why America's K through 12 schools are a monopoly controlled by politicians? Mm. 
Boy, is that a loaded question. <laughs> uh, well, well, there certainly are plenty of people who saw from the start that uh, putting government in charge of education would serve their political agendas, no question about it. The progressives early on, I think, realized that if we're really to uh, uh, you know, reduce uh, in this individual liberty stuff in America and put the state in charge, we've got to get in, in charge of the schools. But there have been plenty of other people, by the millions, who have sort of gone along with that, not realizing that uh, that's part of somebody's <coughs> agenda, but thinking in a well-meaning fashion that government schooling will make sure everybody gets an education. Uh, but it's pretty obvious, isn't it, that that's not been the case. Uh, when anybody suggests a little more school choice, somebody objects saying, uh, well, somebody might fall through the cracks. But what do we have? We have a system in which millions of kids fall through the cracks every year through the government system. Uh, so, yeah, I think one of the most destructive of liberty uh, institutions in America has been government schooling. Uh, don't expect government at any level, federal, state, or local, don't expect government to teach uh, character and don't expect it to teach liberty. Just won't do it, never has. And so if those are important values to you, I think one of the things you should then commit yourself to is getting government out of education, the separation of, of school and state. Larry, one question about character. I think most of us would concede that at some point in our lives, we've let ourselves down or we've let others down, that we've fallen short of our standards of integrity. Now, I know some people that would not make that concession, but <laughs> for most of us, what advice would you give to the person who says, I, I would like to be a person of better character, but I have a past that includes moral failings. Mm -hmm. uh, is it true that once a moral failure, always a moral failure, or is some uh, level of redemption possible? Oh, redemption's always <clears throat> possible. Forgiveness is always possible. You can change. And uh, one of the tragedies of life is that sometimes people who do undergo uh, genuine change, uh, transform themselves into better people, uh, are still discriminated against by others who think, ah, you know, you did some nasty things. Forgiveness is such a great virtue, especially if you're able to discern that the person you're forgiving is truly deserving of it, truly has changed. So, yeah, if I thought people couldn't change, couldn't uh, make uh, their lives better and, and uh, improve on even the nastiest of behaviors, I guess I would give up. I wouldn't even be doing what I'm doing. Uh, I think education and uh, an inner renewal can happen for anybody. And when it does, we should praise that. Have you ever noticed sometimes people in our movement uh, sort of expect all of us who advance liberty to have popped out of the womb with a copy of The Road to Serfdom in our hands? Yeah. But all, in every case, it's been a journey, hasn't it? Uh, few people are instant libertarians. They've come to ideas of liberty over time. It's the same with character. Uh, there are bumps along the way. The question is, are you going to learn from them? Are you uh, uh, going to put the bad ones behind you and, uh, and, and uh, not do that again? That's, uh, that's the important question. And of course, people can make that difference and redeem themselves. Hmm. That's an encouraging message. Do we have any more questions from online? There's another question from the web, and this is from Kanasuke. And this person asks, what can we do to more effectively fight the false generosity of politicians? Oh, the false generosity of politicians. Oh, I'm your savior. I'm going to help you. I've got something for you, and uh, the other guy doesn't want to give it, uh, doesn't like you, or doesn't like uh, a whole class of people. Don't we hear that all the time? Um, I think we should point out that there's nothing about government or going into government that makes you suddenly more compassionate, more caring, more helpful, more considerate than the folks who sent you there in the first place. Nothing. And there are powerful internal incentives in government that tend to take whatever good you got in you and, and eat away at it. Uh, the, the lust for power and to retain it is one of the most uh, powerfully destructive motives uh, uh, on the earth. Um, when government gives something, it's not as if it were a fountain of free goodies. Uh, government has nothing to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. And a government that's big enough to uh, give you everything you want is big enough to take away everything you've got. There's another side to this false generosity that we should be considering. And uh, 
Uh, but there are a lot of other issues you could raise, too. I mean, look right at the moment with a uh, half trillion dollar deficit this year and an 18 trillion dollar national debt, we have a president who's promising a 7%, what's a 7% increase in spending? It's like, uh, you know, look at me, I'm so generous. But, it, but the other side of the coin is he's putting the next generation deep, more deeply into debt. That's unconscionable, isn't it? I think we ought to remind people that um, when government runs these massive deficits to please endless constituencies, it's in effect sending the bill to generations yet unborn. And that isn't just bad economics, that's lousy character. How can you sleep at night doing that to kids you don't even know yet? That's, that is, uh, that's the kind of generosity that is as false as it gets, I think. Um, so you know, the, the real generosity is from the heart, it's personal. It's, it's something that you choose to do. Um, and I'll just leave you with this little uh, line because it makes me think of uh, an example I like to use of the Good Samaritan. Uh, we think of the Good Samaritan as being good. Why? Because he came, along, uh, came upon a man who had been beaten and robbed and was half dead. And what did he do? He didn't say, uh, call the emperor. He didn't say, uh, go see your social worker. He immediately chipped in and helped. He did it with his own time, his own resources, his own love from inside. That's the kind of real generosity that's lasting, that's genuine, that isn't subject to demagoguery and vote buying. It's real, and it's very different from politicians promising you something at other people's expense. Part of becoming a lover of liberty, I think, is the growing up process. It's growing up to realize, wow, I, I'm in charge of my life, and, and I'm accountable for my actions, and I do have uh, some ability to uh, meet my needs and I have no business expecting the rest of the world to give me a living. That's, that's what adulthood should mean. But the welfare state sort of breeds babies by the boatload uh, who are uh, long beyond, beyond their chronological babyhood. But that's, uh, that's the nature of the welfare state. The best way to impart character is to be the best example you can be, especially with kids. That's, that's the way uh, the, they learn and that's what they remember. Uh, I think students and younger people even, uh, they can smell a hypocrite a mile away. And uh, so the last thing you want to do if you want to raise children of good character is to uh, say one thing and yourself do another. Uh, so maybe we all need to constantly ask ourselves, am I being the example that I want others around me, including my kids, to be? If I'm not, I'm not a very good teacher of those values. Larry, some would say that moral codes are not these objective list of do's and don'ts without a point of reference, mm -hmm. but that they're prescriptions for a higher quality of life. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that character is profitable? That in terms of helping us create the results that matter most to us, how does character stack up with Aleister Crowley's maxim of do what thou wilt? Yeah. Well, I think, personally, I think character is always profitable in the long run if you've got a conscience, and, and really doesn't have, just about everybody have a conscience, you want to put yourself in a position someday when you're about to check out, that you can look back on your life and say, I didn't solve every problem and I had plenty of flaws along the way, but once I understood what was right, I did my best uh, to live by the loftiest of rules, to do what was right, to be a person of character. That, uh, I think that is such an, an incredible goal to set in your mind that uh, that's what I'd like to tell young people all the time at our seminars and other places. You'll never regret that if you commit yourself today to a life of character, even sometimes though it may be difficult to achieve, there'll come a time when you'll look back and you'll be proud. Mm -hmm. Your conscience will be pleased and you'll be happy that you did your best to uh, cultivate the highest of character. It'll be more important in your mind than anything else you've done. That's what you want carved on your uh, headstone, something about uh, a man or woman of character, not he produced a lot of stuff or, uh, or whatever. I think the most important thing is to be regarded as a, somebody who uh, walked the, the walk and or is that the phrase, walk the talk, talk the walk, whatever. Somebody who lived uh, to his standards that he preached and uh, was an example for everybody. I, I just don't think of there's a higher calling than that. Hmm.
I think we have time for one or two more questions. What other aspects of uh, moral life um, do you think are important in the fabric of developing a uh, life that you could look back at at your death and say, this has been a good, a good travel? Beyond character, uh, yeah, that takes me, a, requires a few moments of thought because to me, character is everything. It makes all things possible. Without it, nothing else matters. Uh, well, I guess I'd put liberty a close second. Uh, uh, it, it just in a personal, on a personal scale, I hope to be able to look back someday and say, uh, I'm, I was very pleased with what I was able to do on behalf of liberty. And if I'm disappointed, it'll be because I missed an opportunity to advance it. Um, so I would say, yeah, uh, living for character, advancing liberty, they're way high on my list. Uh, way down the list, but still important to me, are things like seeing the world and exploding stereotypes, getting to know people of various cultures and places. That's been uh, a wonderful thing. Uh, that's very important to me. Uh, and just learning, learning as much as you can. Regard learning as a lifelong endeavor, never quit. Uh, there's not a day that goes by that I'm not in just awe of. Uh, Leonard Reed used to talk about this too. I'm in awe of almost everything, all the time. And I, every day I want to learn more about them. Why is that called that thing? Or where, how'd that thing grow there? Where'd it come from? Um, I think a person who is constantly in awe is a person who is automatically introspective, automatically uh, interested in learning, not in bossing around. And so maybe I'd say cultivate a sense of awe uh, about what a wonderful world this is and so many things around us we should be grateful for. Uh, a person who's not in awe tends to, bear, to be a very ungrateful person. And ungrateful people are not fun to be around. Larry, you're a, uh, a noted leader in the, in the liberty movement, and I'm sure you could uh, put your energies into any organization. Why do you choose to put your energies into fee? Oh, thank you, John. That's a great question. Fee, you know, has been very important to me from the earliest days that I became involved in this movement. I was drawn to it, uh, to uh, this movement, I should say, to liberty, uh, because of the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. And even before that, uh, the influence of the movie, The Sound of Music, as a 14-year-old, I just saw the message of that movie as one of, uh, you know, uh, here's a family that hasn't done harm to anybody, and they just want to be left alone, and this rotten regime from next door is coming in, taking over their country, and drafting the father. And uh, th I wanted to know more about that, uh, the history of that period. Uh, and then later, right next door to Austria, where the movie was set, uh, the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia in 68. Um, I immediately joined a group called Young Americans for Freedom. Uh, because they were holding a demonstration in nearby Pittsburgh to protest the invasion. Got involved, signed up, got a package of material loaded with fee stuff, a, subscrip a subscription to uh, the Freeman and uh, uh, ha Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson, and Bastiat's The Law, and uh, Hayek's uh, Road to Serfdom. And the message was, you know, if, if you want to be a good anti-communist, you have to know your moral philosophy and your economics, uh, not just be against uh, violence in the streets. So I had to deepen my understanding. Well, I did that through fee uh, from 1968 on. So I've always felt a great debt to fee. Uh, I started writing for fee in 1977, started speaking at fee seminars in 78 or 9, when Roger Ream, our current chairman, was, weren't you director of seminars at that time, Roger? And then uh, uh, served on the board in the 90s, chaired it for three years. So it's always, it's been in my blood uh, for a long time, since a teenager. Larry, I'm sure I speak for many when I say it's been a great pleasure hearing you share uh, your stories and insights. For those of you who would like to interact with these ideas more deeply, I encourage you to check out Larry's book, Are We Good Enough for Liberty? Also, please visit the Foundation for Economic Education's website at fee.org. Larry Reed, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, TK. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Great thank question. You. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.